Good day and welcome to our second Financial Planning Town Hall. I'm Josh Black. I'm your National Secretary here at the Union and moderator for today's session. Um, once again, thank you for joining us for our second uh, ever Financial Planning Town Hall. So usually monthly we have a retirement seminar in which we walk through all of the steps and everything that involves um, end of career retirement, uh, things that you have to do to retire. Now this one we really focus a lot more on um, people who are on the the earlier end of financial planning. Um, we're going to be talking about budgeting, savings, preparing for both the expected and the unexpected. Um, so we're glad to have you on today and uh, we'll have our regularly scheduled retirement seminar next month. Um, before we get into it though, I'm going to share my screen real quick and show you a resource, APFA.org. We've got a page dedicated to retirement that has a lot of really helpful information to help with uh, navigating retirement. And uh, you'll go to APFA.org. Most people use the mobile device and it will look like this. You'll just hit this little hamburger menu. And under resources, if you hit that arrow, you can find retirement. And once you arrive at the retirement page, you'll find some contact information. And uh, we have a lot of really helpful information, previous town halls, lots of helpful information regarding retirement. Um, so just wanted to point you all to that resource. Right, additionally, um, if you have any questions during this program, please feel free to submit them using the chat feature and we will address uh, any questions that you guys had. And then additionally, after this town hall is over, we'll be sending this video out via hotline and it'll also be published to the APFA.org website. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Kim Tuck, Patrick Hancock, and Ryan Mason to kick us off. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kim Tuck. I'm the APFA Retirement Specialist. Um, Patrick Hancock and Ryan Mason are here with me and they're assisting with the presentation. Uh, they have both worked in the retirement department and Patrick and Ryan both have an interest in financial planning. Um, we're gonna talk about some tips for surviving the climb up the flight attendant pay scale today. And first off, I wanna say that none of us are financial planners or anything like that. There are experts out there. And if you wanna to talk to one of them, great. We can kind of point you in the right direction. We're just trying to let you know of some tips that are available and good advice that we all got from other flight attendants and financial planners on the way. Maybe some things we wished we'd known when we first started out our career. So um, without further ado, let's get started. All right, so our um, the key points of our presentation today are gonna be the ups and downs of the flight attendant profession. Tracking and budgeting, you know, what you are doing with your money. You got to know what you're doing with your money before you start, you know, financial planning. Savings, the 401k, how that works, um, other possible investments, and preparing for the unexpected. So we're going to start out at, with the ups and downs of the flight attendant career, and Ryan's going to talk about that a little bit. All right, okay. All right, ups and downs of the flight attendant profession. Now, we know this industry is a turbulent industry. It has its ups and downs, but... Oh, sorry, the buttons. Oh, yeah, right. But turbulent, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as a flight attendant, though, you'll experience exciting and unique opportunities as, you know, we get to travel the world. You explore new places, you get meet, meeting interesting people, and you get to experience a wide range of cultures, cuisines, um, and this is really part of the exciting part about being a flight attendant. Um, but then we also have the downs, the downtimes. You know, the airline industry um, goes through waves of ups and downs, and there are a number of things that can affect the ability to keep our job and actually do our job. 
you know, most recently the global pandemic that resulted in thousands of flight attendants being furloughed. Um, sometimes we have crazy and unpredictable weather. There's volcanic eruption that shuts down air traffic, um, economic downturns, government funding issues, and something that's real in the future is the possibility of a strike um, as we go deeper into our contract negotiations. So it definitely pays to plan ahead. And that's kind of what leads us into what we're talking about today is planning for, for the good, the bad, and the end, I guess. So probably you're asking yourself, why do I need to think about this stuff now? Well, what you do now has a significant impact on what you're able to do in the future, physically, mentally, and financially. At 60, it will be extremely difficult to get into shape if you have neglected your body for decades. The same is true with our money. And you have a choice between taking control of your money now or being controlled by your money in the future. So my response to that would be get real. We all value our lifestyle, right? And anyone can tell you all you need to do is cut out coffee or eating out. Um, but you know, those people are out of touch. They have no idea how real people spend their money today and maybe in their day, but not today. So do you know where you spend your money? And that's gonna take us into tracking and budgeting. Okay, so talking about how you spend your money, let's start by figuring out where your money is going. Uh, your last paycheck, for instance, was $1,800 and now you have $87 in your account. You might ask yourself, where did it all go? Rent and stuff is not the best answer. Money challenges are common, more common than you think among many of our coworkers. Um, the goal today is to help you have a better understanding of your relationship with money. So tracking your spending is a way of understanding where your money is going and what you don't know could hurt you. You need to commit to tracking what you're spending for 40 days. Yes, 40 days. If at the end of 40 days you still can't do it, try something else. Some credit and debit cards will auto sort your spending, which will allow you to keep track of where your money's going. And that's really important. Um, by the way, can I interest you in an Aviator Red MasterCard? We have a limited time promotion. All right, well, speaking of credit cards, by all means, sell the hell out of that credit card on the airplane. You know, if you're getting the commissions and it works for you, great. If you don't want to flog it on the company dime, then don't do that either. It's your choice, but got to do what works for you. When it comes to your own credit cards, do your best to pay them off each month. It's really important to try and do that. Sometimes it doesn't work and that's sometimes why we have credit cards so we can spread it out a little bit. You need to keep track of what you're doing. If you pay no interest, you win the game. All those bonuses really are free. Credit card companies hate this. So if you, you want to get a big purchase and spread it out over six months or a year, just make sure you keep up with it. And because they love it when you have to pay late fees and you know extra interest and everything. Using your credit cards responsibly and getting a good credit rating, good. Paying late fees and unnecessary interest, bad. So we're going to talk about tracking and budgeting. Yes, the dreaded B word. No, not that one. Budget, budget. Uh, now that you've figured out or you've started to think about where your money is going, it's time to ask yourself, is there a better way to allocate my funds so I can put something aside, cover my expenses and still have some money left for fun? We know budgets are boring. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use the dreaded B word, but try and have some kind of a plan. There are several popular planning methods. One of them is the envelope method. You, you use one envelope for each thing. So one for rent, one for the rest of the bills, one for fun, one for putting aside for a rainy day. That is very like, you know, physical and in your face and that works for a lot of people. Some people do a 20, 30, 50 method where they put aside 20% for goals, 30% of their pay for 
um, wants, things they are saving for, and then the rest 50% for needs, paying the bills, the rent, all that good stuff. Um, some people like to have separate bank accounts for each of these things, needs, savings, and fun. So whatever works for you, you just have to have something in place that works for you. And there are apps out there. There's an app for most things these days, and we've compiled a list of, of you know, with our online research apps that are come highly, coming highly recommended. So according to what we've been able to find online, the best overall free app is Mint. The best app for beginners is called Good Budget. A uh, good app for serious budgeters, you need a budget, Y-N-A-B. I think uh, Ryan may have used that one. I use that. Awesome. Josh uses that one. Um, best paid app for tracking all your money and accounts, Quicken. I think Patrick uses that one. Uh, best app for small business owners, QuickBooks Online. So if you got one of those side hustles going and you need a small business owner account, that's a good option. All right. Who's going to talk about living on a flight attendant salary? Is it me or you? Okay, so living on a flight attendant salary, uh, we, as we all know, and particularly right now when we're in contract negotiations, it can be challenging, but especially when you haven't had a raise in so many years. So um, arrange your life if possible to live on your guarantee. If you have to fly 100 hours a month, you may be miserable if you're forced to, but if you can always pick up hours occasionally to cover those unexpected expenses. Small tweaks can make a very big difference. So the person that spends 98% of their income, it's gonna be much happier than the person that spends 102% of their income. Be brutally honest with yourself about the trade-offs of saving money. Um, balance what you need to save and living your life because you know, enjoying your life is important too. That's why you always have to try and achieve some sort of balance. So think about this. You could commute to a lower cost city. A lot of people do that. That lets them live better and cost, but, it, but that costs you a lot of time. So here's the trade-off. If that works for you, you should do it. Um, you could also live where you want with multiple roommates to save money. If that trade-off is good for you, go for it. Sounds good or hell to the no. All right, any questions about budgeting and savings? Patrick, any good general questions about budgeting and savings? Um, one, of, one of the questions that we get regularly is, um, is it, if, if you run into a, I can't figure out how to save or do it on my, you know, by myself, don't be afraid to ask for help. Financial planners aren't just for people with money to invest. Financial planners have thought about all this stuff like, you know, Quicken isn't working for me. What, I, I forget to put in that, how do, I, how do I plan ahead? Financial planners are great, great for that sort of question. Uh, the other thing is find some people you're flying with that seem to have their act together. I said act, don't look at me like I use that <laughs> other word. Uh, and, uh, and ask them, hey, what are you doing? And try and find people that are similarly situated that that have a better handle on it than you do. You don't have to tell them they have a better handle because they're a little bit over your head. But um, find find people that seem to be handling their their stuff and ask them how they're doing that. Um, the the good people copy, great people steal. So you know it's uh, ideas. So let's do it. And another good thing is if you make it a habit, you know that's going to help you a lot. It's hard at first, but once it becomes a habit and when you just start doing it without thinking about it, I mean, you can accrue quite a bit of savings, you know, and it doesn't seem as painful, but at first it's always painful. So um, we're going to launch into saving and some tips for that. And uh, am I still talking about this? You're still talking. Okay. okay. So tips for savings. Sorry, we tweaked our presentation and I'm a little rusty. So thanks for your patience. All right, so here's some good tips. Um, one of the best tips for saving is pay yourself first. So what does that mean? Paying yourself includes saving today and saving for the future. So you wanna set aside money before you pay anyone else for yourself. 
And if it comes out of your check, it's easier automatically out of your check. It's a lot easier than transferring money into your main account. Kind of like taking oxygen before you assist passengers in a decompression. You want to make sure you cover your needs first. So, but how can I do this on a new higher salary? Well, you start with small deposits and make them automatic. You know, you can have a certain amount automatically put into your checking account, um, a savings account, the credit union, a separate account. Just want to keep it uh, separate from the money that you spend so you have a little bit of savings going. Um, I had uh, some advice from my dad when I first started flying that he, he said if I save $30 a month or $30 a paycheck and put it in an interest bearing account, I would be a millionaire, you know, by the time I retired. And I wish I had done that. I thought <laughs> my dad was an old fuddy daddy. So, um, you know, anything like that, even if you're starting with 20 or 30 or $50 a paycheck, if you can do that, it's great. It's a beginning. So, all right. So then we have emergency savings. Experts recommend three to six months of living expenses in like an emergency slush fund. Realistically, though, anything is better than nothing. You know, if you have something that you can say we go on strike, you know, something to cover your your food bills for a week or two. Hopefully it wouldn't be beyond that. Maybe a few days of nervousness, but um, Stress, yeah. it's a good idea to have enough on hand to cover your insurance deductibles, for example. What if we all had to go on COBRA all of a sudden? Anybody who was furloughed recently remembers that situation. Uh, it's also uh, recommended to have your emergency funds separate for, from your other savings. So, you know, keep savings for your house, for example, um, a wedding separate from your emergency fund savings. All right, so now that we're talking about savings, Patrick's going to talk to us a little bit about saving in the 401k and another good way to accrue um, interest and more money. All right, thank you, Kim. Let's talk about the 401k. Um, the question is, what is a 401k? How does it work and how to avoid working forever? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> I, don't, you know, I love my job. I don't want to do it forever. Uh, I don't want to die on the jump seat. Yeah. Like yeah. No, yeah. please do. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. All right, let's talk about the 401k. The 401k is a company-sponsored retirement account. And you, Despite the rumor to the contrary, you can start contributing to the 401k from day one of your employment. Now, the employer match and contribution, that starts after one year of service. And so sometimes people get that confused in their head, but you can start from day one. The company contribution is going to be 3%, and they're going to put that into that 401k account, whether you do anything or not. The second part of the company money depends on what you do. It's a good idea to contribute at least two and a half percent so you don't miss out on the free money match from the company. If you don't put any money into your account, American gets to put that two and a half percent they were going to give you and put it in their pocket and apply it to their executive party fund. So don't, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. So how do you contribute? Your contribution is designed, defined as a percentage of eligible income. Uh, you go to the Fidelity website and it says contributions. You click on that and you're going to see several different types of, of contributions you can make. One is to the uh, regular 401k, one is to the Roth 401k, one is to the uh, after tax. Ignore that one unless your financial planner told you to do that. And then there's the uh, special, I forget the name for the uh, the special. Uh, the special okay. the, the, yeah, special, yeah, special collections. Uh, and that would be for like profit sharing, which is a timely topic. So when you got your profit sharing check, they didn't look and see what you had defined up at the top under the regular Roth. They looked at that bucket to see whether or not you wanted any of that to go into your 401k. I talked to a friend yesterday who <laughs> looked up their their profit sharing and they said, they didn't take anything out of my 401 for my 401k. I said, Go to, yeah, they had left that at zero. So they weren't able to make any contributions to their 401k out of that. So you want to make sure that you get that filled out as well. Um, how much can you contribute? Well, in 2024, you can put in $23,000. Woohoo! Woo um, of course, you probably can't do that if you're a new hire unless someone else is paying your bills. But, and that maximum is indexed for inflation. It just went up from, uh, from 2023, uh, and it moves up in $500 increments. The 2024 catch-up contributions 
are 7,500. What's a catch up? Well, they know us boomers were terrible at saving because we were never going to get old. We were never going to retire. So we didn't bother to plan for retirement. Don't, don't be a boomer. Don't make those mistakes because now we're making up for it by doing these catch up contributions in addition to the 23,000 we're putting in the 7,500. So we're putting in 30,500, which means we are living on nothing. Okay. We wish we were doing both of those. Yeah. So, some of us You're are not? and some of us are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. So, and the good news is, is that even if, if you are actually doing that, you're contributing the full 30,500, What's that mean for your company contribution? The good news is the company contribution is over and above that. So you can put in this amount and it doesn't, what the company puts in doesn't affect that at all. So there are two ways, to, two options to contribute. One is the traditional 401k, and that's the one we always think about. You pay no taxes when you contribute, but you pay taxes on the contributions earnings. In other words, everything that's in there when you withdraw. And uh, how much tax you're going to pay depends on how much income you have in the year in which you withdraw. Then we've got the 401k Roth. Uh, and the Roth 401k, you pay taxes on the money before you put it into the Roth, which, you know, you're like, wait, I'm paying taxes on money I'm not going to get. Yeah, you're not going to get it now. But here's the thing. You pay no taxes on the withdrawal and you the money you put in, and you pay no taxes on the interest that it earned. That's really cool. That's tax free money. You should know that even if you do 100% into the Roth 401k, and if you're kind of junior, that's really a great thing to do because you'll see in a minute that, that the interest is the important part of the 401k. The employer contribution match is always going to be placed in the traditional account. So even though you're putting 100% into the Roth 401k, you're going to have money in both buckets. How does that compare to the other options I have out there? Well, we just said you've got that uh, 23,7500 catch up for the 401k or the 401k Roth. The IRA is 7,000. Wait, that's a lot less. Yeah, you can max that out pretty easy. Plus 1,000 for the catch up, same numbers for the Roth. The simple IRA, you know, we were talking about that side gig. So you can put money into out of your side gig uh, into the simple IRA. Could I do both? Can I do all three? Absolutely. Health savings account, pretty cool thing. If you uh, if you can do the core plan, you have an option for a health savings account. You can put into a max of forty one fifty uh, plus a thousand catch up. So that's another option. Yet talk to your financial planner. Did you know that Uncle Sam will pay you to save? Yes. Um, if you are single. Married filing separately or called by widower, and you make uh, less than $23,000, Uncle Sam will give you a refundable credit of 50% 50, 50 of your contribution. What's that mean? That means if you put $10,000 into your, uh, well, say you put $4,000 into your uh, 401k and your adjusted gross income and that's after all those deductions so even though twenty three thousand sounds a little low remember that's after all your deductions if your adjusted gross income is twenty three thousand dollars uncle sam will give you two thousand of that back in your your taxes which is pretty cool and that those brackets go up as you get to head of household bearing filing jointly and uh this is this is really cool if you if you are at beginning of your career and you have you're in the lower Pay brackets, Uncle Sam will help you save for retirement. What's vesting? No, that's not that pretty blue thing you wear on your uniform. No, no. Vesting means it's your money to take with you when you leave. You're, you're always 100% vested in your own contributions, which means if you put in $100, you can take that with you when you leave. It's yours. You become vested, in other words, it becomes your money in all the company contributions and matches after being the plan for 24 months. So if you decide you've had enough of the glamorous lifestyle, at least try to stick it out for 24 months so you don't lose the free money from the company. At 23 months, you leave, they get to keep all that. At 24 months, you leave, you get to take it all with you. So take the, it with you. Take it with you. Absolutely. So. Let's talk about how that 401k is going to work. If you contribute $4,000 a year after, oh, wait, wait, 
at $4,000, remember, this is pre-tax. It hasn't been taxed yet. So a thousand of that $4,000 belongs to Uncle Sam. But you get to hang on to it for a little while. But just remember that. So yeah. So after 10 years, you've got $40,000. And it grows over time. By the time you get ready to retire, those contributions are going to grow, going to be total $148,000. And you not only have the contributions you put in, but if you're earning interest on the contributions, you're going to have over $200,000. But that's not the secret of long-term retirement planning. What's the secret? secret? The secret is you not only earn interest on your contributions, you earn interest on the interest. You know what happens? Look at this. Uh, By the really, time you get ready. It's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> By the time you get ready to retire, you've got four hundred and sixty thousand dollars because look at so much of your income by or your total by, by the time you get ready to retire is interest and interest on the interest. So yeah, I call I, if you you look at that. Remember that four thousand dollars from the first year. Well, a thousand dollars of that belongs to Uncle Sam, and he wants it back. So what happened to that thousand dollars over the course of that all that time that it was sitting in there? It grew to five thousand dollars. So Uncle Sam gets his thousand dollars back. You get to keep the four thousand dollars difference. So you've been earning interest on Uncle Sam's money. That's the cool thing about deferred uh, taxes, uh, deferred taxes on retirement savings. You get to earn interest on Uncle Sam's money. Now the problem is you still pay income tax on that four thousand dollars. But I'd rather pay tax on four thousand dollars I did, I have than for not pay tax on four thousand dollars I don't have. <laughs> All right, so I've got these two choices: the four hundred one k traditional and the four hundred one k Roth. Which one should I choose? Let's go back to our four thousand um, dollars. You contribute four thousand dollars pre tax, and it grows to twenty thousand dollars. Let's assume a twenty five percent tax rate. You withdraw it. You have to pay tax on the entire 20,000, 25% tax is 5,000. So that leaves you with 15,000 to spend. On the Roth, you pay the 25% on the front end. So you've only got $3,000 to contribute. It grows to $15,000, but you don't pay tax on anything. That, well, yeah, who cares? But Patrick, was, that's the same amount. That's the same. Life. That is, that is. And what I really care is how much I have left to spend. However, life is not so simple. That's only true because we assume the tax bracket was the same in all years, 25%. What if the tax bracket were 10% at the beginning when I'm a poorly paid flight attendant and 36% at the end because I'm that wealthy retiree I really want to be? Well, all of a sudden you got a different answer. What you've got left to spend in the traditional is 12,800 and in the Roth, 17,500. So summing that all up, if you've got time to let that grow, the Roth is a better choice. Talk to a financial planner. <laughs> so what is the big deal with 401k investing? I have years. No, I have decades to save for retirement, and that is true. The question is, do you want to do the savings the easy way or the hard way? Obligatory story illustration. We have two flight attendant classmates, Hardy Patty, age 25, and Smart Susan, age 25, and they are the best of friends. Yeah. They hear they should start their 401k account. So Party Patty signs up to contribute 5000 a year. That's about $200 a paycheck. And then totally forgets about it because, you know, like Smart Susan says she's going to get her financial affairs in order before she starts contributing. Fast forward two years, the two clients are now 35 years old. Smart Susan tells P Party Patty that she has her financial affairs in order and wants to start contributing 5000 a year to her 401k. Well, Susan, of course, is a know-it-all. Party Patty, now having some financial troubles and after 10 years and $5,500 in contributions later, decides she's going to stop contributing and never does it again. Smart Susan however contributes that $5,000 a year from 35 to age 60. She puts in a total of 130. So over their career, Party Patty put in 55,000. Smart Susan put in 130,000. So we know who's gonna have the better retirement, right? Obviously, yeah, it's Party Pat. What? 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 Yeah, with an annual APR percentage rate at the age of 60, Party Patty's gonna have 615. Smart Susan's only gonna have 431,000. Oh my God, run the numbers. There it is. Yeah. But the secret of magic of retirement savings is not how much you earn and contribute to your retirement account. The magic is how much your money can earn for you. Party Patty put in 55,000 and her money earned another 560,000 in interest. 
Smart Susan put in more, 130, but only earned 341,000. And that's because Party Patty's money had more time uh, to earn interest in, in, than Smart Susan's. Remember in high school economics, I used to hate that stuff, but you know the you dollar uh, today is worth more than a dollar next year? That's the whole time value of money thing. Yeah, the flip side of that is true as well. A dollar saved today is worth more than a dollar saved at 65. How much more? Well, let's look at this. If you save a dollar at age 55, at age 65, it's worth a dollar 48. If you save a dollar at age 20, it's worth 584. So even though it's harder to put the money in now because you're not getting, yeah, it's going to be worth so much more when you final, finally get to retirement age. You know, and it, it is all about time. And so time is your friend when it comes to many things. It can also be your enemy. For example, you're 25, you're in great shape, you have the drive and command, want to be a world-class gymnast. Yeah, too mm -hmm. late. Gymnasts retire at age 25. So that ship has sailed and you waited too long. Now let's think about this with your money. The longer you waited to get into shape with your money, the harder it's going to be. You know, we, when you're young, you have much more opportunity to, to change the course of your life. And uh, you should take advantage of that. It's time to act now. But Patrick, being underpaid makes stuff like this hard. Well, we hope you, we've convinced you that it's important, uh, the, the 401k account, to invest in the 401k account. And please trust, we've not forgotten how hard it is to be underpaid. There are basic steps, baby steps that you can take is the best way to start. You, of course, must contribute to and a half percent to your 401k account. Otherwise, you're missing out on the two and a half percent match Americans going to give you. You miss out on the free money. And we know you love AA, but don't give them your money. All right. Yeah. So how do we do that? Let's look at the Hancock Savings Plan. When we get a new contract, hopefully soon, Lord, you will get two raises a year on your flight attendant anniversary. And then when everyone gets a contractual raise. Split them with yourself. Half goes to your, your pockets, so you can buy a better brand of ramen noodles, and half goes into your 401k account. For example, you get a 2% raise, increase your 401k contribution by 1%, keep the other 1%. Your spending money goes up, and your future self will be very grateful for your savings. One of the options you have, and in terms of your contributions, is you can go in there and you can check the box that says, bump this up every year on my anniversary by some percent. 1% is a good number, 2% is a better number, and you will be surprised that it will go up and you won't even notice it. One of the crazy things about our paychecks is most of us can't tell you what our middle of the month check is going to be because our pay varies so much. It's always kind of a surprise. I mean, how much? Oh, or oh, yeah. So you can you can have that contribution rise automatically and really, I tell you, you're not going to notice it. So yeah, so that's the Hancock Savings Plan. Let's talk about investments. Yeah, how do I pick my, pick my investments? Well, if you do nothing else, you just throw money in there. The default investment in the 401k account is the age target fund. What's that mean? What they do is they say, okay, your age target, you're age 30 now. We predict you're going to retire at, at age 65. So they set the mix between stocks and bonds and all that stuff so that that it's going to be in the right place when you turn 65. And uh, as you get old, it, get older, it becomes less aggressive. So that by the time you get ready to retire, you're in pretty conservative investments because if something terrible happens, like the stock market goes down again, and boy, well, over the last couple of years, we've just been on a roller coaster ride. <laughs> and if you're closer to retirement, you're not going to have as much time to recover from a down. So we make it much more conservative that the downs are much easier. The problem is that also means the ups are, 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 are less steep as well. If you're younger and the market goes down, you still got 30 years to recover. So that's why it becomes less and less aggressive as you get closer to retirement. If you want to go in and do it, there are like 26, do it yourself, there are like 26 different investments you can choose from, all kinds of things. High yield bond fund, large stack, cap stock index, emerging markets, um, you know, which is all the new techie thing stuff. U.S. small cap and index fund, which I like to think of as like the Main Street investing. You're you're investing in the folks that are just starting out going. If handling your own investments and going through those and makes you nervous, there are options out there um, there that you can you can 
uh, seek out for guidance. There's a 401k maximizer email, uh, uh, email account. There's a Easy Tracker. They contact them at Easy Tracker 401k. The A Credit Union has free financial advisors for its members, and they can they can advise you on on how to invest in these things based on your risk uh, tolerance. Fidelity offers investment services for a percentage fee. The fee depends on how much money they're managing for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, th there's lots of places to learn. Uh, podcasts and online videos are available for any kind of investor if you want to further your financial education. So you can get yourself educated, do it yourself. You can get outside investment. Um, you can you can get all kinds of different financial planners. Just make sure that if you get a financial planner, you know what, how they're getting their money, how they're getting paid, because you want them to be picking things based on what's best for you, not what gives them the biggest commission. And these are all just examples. APFA doesn't endorse any of these people. Just, uh, you know, look around and, and you can start looking around with these folks. What if you're a do-it-yourself investor, you're educated, you want to do all this stuff, you can invest your 401k in almost any legal U.S. investment without the, within the protection of a 401k. Wait a minute, Patrick, you just said there's 26 investments. Yeah, there's a 27th. And the 27th is the brokerage link. And uh, it's a stock investment option inside of the 401k. How do I do that? Well, you go online, call Fidelity, open a brokerage link account, and it's like a 27th investment in there, and you put money into there. And once you've got money in there, you can invest in almost anything sold on a U.S. exchange, like stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, ADRs, GDRS, commodity futures, and coming soon, crypto is coming. You can even invest in crypto inside of your 401k through the brokerage link account. Is there something you can invest in? Yes, there is. You cannot invest in American Airlines stock, which is probably really good advice, actually. <laughs> yeah. Love you guys, but yeah, not buying your stock. So, all right. <laughs> all right. Josh, we have questions. Yes. All right. Um, as a new employee, when does the company match contri uh, contribution start? That's a great question. So as a new employee, um, you can um, you can start contributing to your 401k from day one. The company match and the contribution will start after one year of service. Uh, how do we go about changing traditional IRA to a Roth IRA? Well, you've got a couple of options on that. Um, the challenge is, you know, the Roth contributions are after tax. The traditional are before tax. So if you can take it out of the before tax and put it into the after tax, right in the middle of that transition is tax. So you have to pay tax on it when you do the transition. Um, and the thing is, it's not like a separate taxable thing. Say you take 50,000 out of one and put, they take that 50,000 and they add it to all of your income for taxation in that year, which means you may put yourself into a higher tax bracket because you added all that extra income in that one year, even though you didn't get a dollar of it because it all went over there. So you want to you want to do that with some advice because it's some good tax advice. Talk to a financial planner and add, tell them you've got a tax question. Some financial planners are going, no, 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 don't talk to me. Here's here's a guy. Call this woman. She's got good information. Uh, and others are, are educated on it and will give you it. But, um, you do it by going online at uh, Fidelity, filling out the, the transfer form, and uh, they do the transfer and send you the tax uh, notice and the tax income information. It's easy. It's just hard because of the taxes. And I think we had a question from someone before. I don't know what happened to it about... Uh, he seemed like a pretty savvy investor and he had studied financial planning. So again, we're not credentialed. We're just, you know, sharing good advice. Yeah. Um, but if you, the right if you yeah. have heard 
that something like an S&P 500 mutual fund is the best investment and that's what you want to invest in. And that option is not one of those 26 options that's listed there. You can go through the brokerage window that Patrick was talking about and invest in that if you prefer to invest in that. So even though it looks like we're limited, you can through that brokerage window invest in pretty much anything that you want. What are the advantages of reaching 59 and a half concerning the 401k? Is it a good time to move money away from the 401k and into an IRA or Roth IRA? Um, the, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the, the problem is, is that the, the advantages in a 401k and an IRA are that people inherit it different. Your costs, what's, what it's going to cost to have someone hold that account for you are different. And uh, your investment options aren't going to be any better in the IRA unless you really want to buy American Airlines stock. So um, a lot of people will tell you you need to move it from the 401k to an IRA for more flexibility. But with the brokerage link window, I'm not sure what other additional flexibility you have. If someone tells you that, just make sure that they're telling you that you've got good reasons to do it and not just uh, when you move that huge chunk of money into the IRA that that person gets a commission on you moving it in there. All right, uh, we are good to continue. Oh, sorry, I think we've got to uh, explain catch-up contributions. Sure, catch-up contributions are for people over the age of 50 that didn't do a good job before the age of 50, and now they <laughs> now, now they need to catch up. And uh, that allows you to exceed that annual maximum of $23,000 uh, by, by an additional $7,500. I'm 47 years old with 25 years seniority with AA and have approximately 20 years left before retirement. All of my 401k funds are in the target fund. I contribute 15% of my paycheck to my retirement. What is the maximum I can contribute in 2024? And what are the rules about catch-up payments? Good question. Okay, you're too young for the catch-up because you're not yet 50. But remember that because when you hit 50, you'll you know, put, put that on your 50th birthday cake. And good, good for you. Good, yeah. for, you good for, for you. Good for you for 15%. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, and, and that's it. You're, you're, in a, you're in the sweet spot right now. You're, you're, on, track, you're on track. You've got money. Um, and... Uh, the, you can, and like we said, because you don't, you're not yet eligible for the catch up, you're limited to 23,000 in your 401k. If you're putting the full 23,000 in and feel constrained, you have other options. You can put the next one into your, your IRA, open an IRA, put in another $7,000 of the IRA. You still want to put more away? See if you are eligible for a simple IRA, put more money into there. You want to you want to try and save even more than that. You can open an HSA if you're willing to go through uh, that and save money in the HSA. Uh, there's some really good uh, YouTube videos out there on maximizing a, an HSA. I, I never thought of that as an investment option. I always think of that as a, a health insurance thing. And actually, you can use it as an investment option, too. After you retire. Patrick, can you tell us um, when a when somebody meets that max, that 401k max, what happens if, if they let's say they met the 23,000 in um, September and they're still what does it automatically stop or do they have to um, reconcile at the end of the year and pay money back or how does that work? The when you hit the max, they stop taking money out of your check. You'll get your middle of the month check though. Uh, this that's is way too much. What happened? <laughs> yeah, that's because you maxed out. So they automatically stop that. Um, and uh, uh, you you can you should pay attention to that. And if you're putting that much money in, you're you're probably paying attention to that. And uh, you can then redirect to an IRA or your your alternate investment options. Good yeah, question. I think this member also asked, what's the max that you can contribute in terms of percentage? So you can contribute 100% of your income every month if you can afford to do that. Say you have a second job, or but once you hit the max, that will stop. So there are some people that use that strategy. 
they want to get all their contributions into their 401k done at the beginning of the year. So they'll do 100% until they hit the max, and then well, be, then they're done. You know, nice. it'd be nice. <laughs> they, no, that would not be. I know. Right? They, they must have married better than yeah. I did. That's all I can figure. <laughs> and and I always say do 95% because you need a little bit left in there to make sure you pay your union dues. Union dues. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and your benefit. Care premiums. And your health care premiums. Absolutely. <laughs> And you know the other the other option reason for doing that and just being done with it is that that means that money's in there earning interest for you the whole year instead of only a partial part of the year. So if you're going to do that, do it up front and get it all in there. And if you're single, <laughs> is the four hundred one k whether it's traditional or Roth FDIC insured? No. All right, Thank you. All right um, that is all our questions for now, and we need to continue. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now what? We're paying. I'm paying myself first and working hard to pay off my debts and not creating any new debts. I'm covering my expenses just barely. Trust me, I know what that means. Uh, but we're doing it. Uh, I even have a little left over for shopping, entertainment, the fun stuff. So you think your work here is done? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> then life comes and smacks you in the face. So what happens if you're unable to work? How do you protect yourself? How do you protect your family and your income? All that hard work that you've done. And then have, here are some tips on planning for the unexpected. So preparing for the unexpected, we have protection available to you. APFA has negotiated um, in our contract with the company sick time. We have maternity disability. We even currently have one year of active premiums for your health benefits if you are out on an unpaid leave, which as Kim had mentioned earlier, the active rate to, and then going into COBRA. Two different things. Very different in amounts. Um, the, gov uh, the government also has protections, workman's comp, unemployment, social security disability. Um, some states, I'm based in LA, which also offers a short-term disability for California residents. Other options and protection that's available to you, APFA offers disability insurance, accident, critical illness, hospital indemnity, whole life, supplemental, dental, and cancer insurance. These are all insurances specific to um, you know, if, if you're in an accident, you know, there was an incident for me. I had I have accident insurance. I fell and broke my arm. I was out for a couple weeks and this provided me a, a little bit of money to help supplement the money that I lost from from not being able to fly because I could not push a beverage cart. <laughs> did you really try that? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I did not try. <laughs> um, so in these are dire situations but they could they could help it, in that moment i i don't know it might have been fifteen hundred dollars but it, it helped it helped in that moment to pay for an mri bill that on my insurance only covered you know 25 percent of mm -hmm. um so it, it, it made it less less of a stressful situation so american airlines also has added benefits that you can sign up for some are um you have to sign up during open enrollment some are available year-round um, disability insurance, short-term and long-term disability. Um, if you have a state that offers short-term disability like California, you're not able to sign up for the short-term disability through the company. Um, accident insurance, critical illness insurance, hospital indemnity insurance, term life insurance, and pet insurance. Actually, in New York, there's a state disability, but it's such a low amount that you are allowed to opt for the company disability because it's higher. Oh, so okay. you would get the New York state disability and it would be supplemented by the AA short term. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Yeah, I, but the California benefits comparable, so you know, they don't <laughs> encourage you to pay for it <laughs> twice because you're paying for it out of your paycheck in California as, a, yeah. as an employment tax. Oh, I agree. <laughs> yeah, and I will say that that's too. So the the um, the APFA disability insurance that um, I also had in that same situation where I broke my arm, I was getting disability insurance from the state of California. That disability insurance helped pay, and then the accident insurance. So it was a um, all inclusive situation to help supplement 
the money that was not coming in. Replace <laughs> some of your income and yes. help cover some of your medical bills, right? Correct, yeah. And that's the idea. Yep. But I'm young and healthy. You know, the easiest and cheapest time to get life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care insurance is when you're young and healthy. Um, when you get these insurance insurances, insurances? Yeah, this coverage or insurance. <laughs> I'll go with it. Um, when you get these types of coverages, um, they oftentimes come with a um, physical exam, medical exam, some sort of um, blood test or um, process in order to get approved. And so if you wait until you are older or have some sort of health issues, you can be denied coverage or be determined at a higher risk, um, which then has increased premiums. But when you do it when you're young, healthy, um, you can have you can lock in those lower premiums and they don't go back if something were to happen to you um, medically to then then start charging you more than would do that. Right. Too. When you're first employed, they don't ask you any health questions at all. You can just sign up for everything, you know, but you think I'm poor, I'm poor, yeah. it's all gonna come out of my paycheck. But think about doing it, especially having some disability insurance because it takes a while to build up your sick time, you know, and we don't accrue it as quickly as we would like to. You know, it takes a while to build up your eligibility for family leave, things like that. So um, the disability insurance and life insurance and things like that, if you take it right away when you're first employed, they don't ask any health questions. After that, yeah. every year, if you just decide to put in for it and you didn't before, they make you fill out a little statement of health. And so if you're, uh, if you've had a few health issues, yeah. then they may deny you that coverage. And so... Like you said, it's easier to get it when you're young and healthy. And that the long-term care insurance is um, probably the hardest one sometimes to to um, to think about because you think, well, I'm in my 20s. Why am I thinking about long-term care? But as you get older and you have and you see, you know, different family members or your parents that are um, maybe unable to take care of themselves. Um, and they're put in long-term care homes. I think they, I mean, I don't quote on this, but they could run eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars a month. It's easy. crazy. Um, it's easy. crazy. And yeah, and so this, you locking something in like this when you're young could really help your future self, your future kids, your future grandkids, um, which is all about planning ahead. So life insurance options, I mentioned um, term life insurance and then the other option is whole life insurance. So term life insurance is defined as in a set of years that you're covered. You know, you can get a 10 year policy, 20 year policy, something like that. Um, they usually have lower premiums and they're merely just a death benefit. In the event that you pass away, um, it provides a um, set money amount to whoever you decide for it to go to. Um, whole life insurance policy, it's something that you have for life, usually is a higher premium. It comes with that death benefit, but it also um, has a living benefit, um, which is sometimes um, I've read that rich people like this because the living benefit part of a whole life insurance policy is not connected to the market. Um, so you can gain a return um, on the money that you are contributing and sometimes when you think about um, COVID um, if let's say in 2020 right when COVID hit or 2021 when all was hell break, was breaking loose with the stock market now that probably was not the best time to pull money out of your 401k so if because of how much money it might have lost so if you had money in another bucket that maybe wasn't attached to that um, that market, it's also an option. So what that kind of means, I think, and tell me if I'm right, is the the whole life insurance accrues a cash value. Correct. And then if, if you need to tap into that while you're still alive, you can. Yep. Okay. And it comes to a point, and I, I don't know the, the exact year, there comes to a point where you have to start withdrawing from it, I believe. Yes, and, and there are a couple of different types of whole life. Uh, most of them you reach an age and they require you start taking money back out of it because uh, it, it's designed to help you with your life, not to make your kids rich when you die. Correct. 
So other ways to protect yourself, we addressed this a little bit earlier, having an emergency fund, three to six months of living expenses and, you know, using COVID again as a reference, um, six months is probably a, on the on the safer side. Um, you know, it's good to have a side hustle. Flight attendants are great. Um, and it never hurts to have a gig on the side um, to bring in extra money. I have a gig on the side. Patrick, Patrick has a gig on the side. Have a gig on the side. <laughs> I have had a gig on yeah, this yeah, side. Probably, <laughs> yes. You know, in, invest in yourself. Improve, you know, improve yourself today for future options. Um, one of the great things about being a flight attendant, we have flexibility to do um, other things. You can go back to school, you know, for a degree or certification, learn a new skill set, something, something that can earn you extra money either now or in the future. So takeaways today, we're kind of understanding the ups and downs of what our job looks like and being part of the flight attendant profession. Um, you know where your money's going by tracking and budgeting it. We have a plan in place for savings, paying yourself first and building that emergency fund. You know, paying yourself first includes starting a 401k early, even if you start small, you know, with those, you know, getting that free money from the company, set it up, forget about it. Um, you know, try to understand the investment side if that interests you. Um, and then just remember life happens um, and it's consider different protection um, coverage in order to help alleviate some of the stress that comes with life in general. And the flight <laughs> you know, attendant job in particular. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, it's not easy to get started. Uh, that's kind of why we put together this presentation, um, you know, but taking, taking the next step or take the next step, but you can do this. One day your older self will. Thank you. I think so. I think so. Yep. Yeah. My older self wishes I just to my dad. Yeah. <laughs> so that brings us to question. Question. All right. Well, first of all, I pull up these questions. Thank you guys. I know this is a lot of really great information to help people plan, and we appreciate uh, you going through this information. So, the remaining questions that we have, and you guys feel free to send any questions that you may have still, um, but the remaining questions we have are regarding some of our uh, normal retirement um, seminar questions. So we'll go through those, and then again, feel free to send any questions that you guys might have. Um, first, for those LAA employees who have part of our pension, is it true that if you are single, not legally married, you lose part of your pension. And so far as part of your pension goes to a spouse, and if you don't have a spouse, AA keeps it. Question mark. I think I know where this is coming from, and it, that's not really accurate. If you have a legacy AA pension and you retire and you're single, you don't lose part of your pension. You know, it's yours. You get the single life annuity or whatever option you choose. If you retire and start your pension as a single person, you can choose to have a joint annuitant or a beneficiary. So you still have all of those options. The thing that is different with the legacy AA pension is if somebody passes away prior to their retirement. So if you were to pass away prior to your retirement and you're married, your spouse automatically gets a 50% joint and survivor annuity. If you, there's a form that's called the QIPSA form. It's a qualified pre-retirement survivor annuity form. And if you fill that out and you have to be LAA married and have an LAA pension, but if you fill that out, you can elect to say, if something happens to me, I die before I can commence my pension, I am electing for my spouse to get 100% of my pension. So the place where the single people lose out, so to speak, is if you were to pass away before you <clears throat> retire and commence your pension and you're a single person, you can't fill out that form and you can't leave your pension to anyone because you're dead. You know, you can't retire and choose your option. So if you die before you start your pension as a single person, nobody gets it. So if you're a single person and you have health issues, you know, make sure you request your pension paperwork and, and give it to somebody and fill it out and sign it and have it sitting there in case something happens. So that doesn't happen. You can sort of prepare for this scenario if you're having health issues or something, 
now if you get hit, hit by a bus, you can't really prepare for that scenario, but you know, you can try and be somewhat prepared if, if you are having health issues in the event that something happens and you want somebody else to benefit from your pension. Great. So did I answer you got that? It. You got it. Um, all right, next pension question. After 35 years with AA, 10 as a cardio agent, 25 as a fire tenant, what would my monthly pension payout be? I've got an easy answer for you. <laughs> Go to Fidelity, which is netbenefits.com slash AA, and you will see on there um, your flight attendant pension. Now, it's hard to tell because the, the cutover date, you may have two pensions listed there. One would be your cargo agent pension and one would be your flight attendant pension. Or if you transfer it over to a flight attendant before the magic date, then it'll all be in your one flight attendant pension. But that's that's where you uh, you can run the scenarios as to what your pension's going to be. I spend way too much time playing on that one because you can say, what if I retire at 65? What's my pension going to be? What if I retire at 65 and I leave some to my best friend here? What's my pension going to be? You can say, what if I wait and retire at 67 or 69 or yeah, and you can just make it crazy. Um, retire at age 80. What's my pension going to be? Of course, then I have to think about if I retire at age 80, how many months of that increased pension am I going to get? So, yeah, but it's a great tool and that would answer your question exactly. And Fidelity will also show up for 401k contributions but based on how much you're contributing now. This is what your expected amount would be when you come to retirement. So it's a great, great what if yeah. tool to play with. And also it's not apples and oranges because you may have, you know, been single and worked your butt off and worked lots of hours. And then somebody, your exact same seniority with the exact amount of years may have taken lots of leaves yep. and maybe had four kids, so they took time off for that. So, or back in the day when we could drop our trips, dropped a lot of trips to go study in Europe or something. So you really can't compare just by years and seniority. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's, every 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 situation's unique. Yeah, because I think the for the 401k, right, it's if, if it looks at it now, you're contributing, let's say 10%, they're assuming that you're going to make 10% of that amount for the same amount for the next you know, and you might years. bump it up as you get raises. So. Oh, <laughs> raises, when my raise comes through. Oh, yes, when, when. <laughs> yes. Um, how can we uh, maximize our pension for retirement? The longer I continue to fly, how does my pension grow? For example, if I fly till I'm 70 plus, what does my pension grow for? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try and take this one and and Patrick might have to help me, but your pension, if you're a PBGC um, pension holder, there is an actuarial increase. So if you don't start your pension at the full, well, at the early retirement age or the full retirement age, your pension will in, continue to increase. I don't know. When it stops increasing, you'd have to call the PBGC to find that out. But I did just talk to somebody yesterday who waited, you know, maybe five years past the full pension date, and she said it had increased, you know. So uh, definitely worth checking into. And if you call the PBGC, they will tell you that and let you know. And with the legacy AA pensions, our full pension age is age 60. Um, our early pension age is age 55. If you start at 55, there's a 3% reduction for every year prior to age 60. If you start at age 60, you get what's supposedly your full pension rate. But there's a little wrinkle in there that if you work until age 70 and a half, the bean counters who wrote the pension plan say, well, wait a minute, that person you know, could have been taking their pension for the last 10 years. So after age 70 and a half, we're going to start giving them a very gradual monthly increase, an actuarial increase, because we think as, you know, accounting guys who know everything, they're getting closer to death. So we're going to allow them to get a little bit more. So between 60 and what, 70 and a half? No change. After 70 and a half, a very gradual monthly increase. So, um, did, have I answered that question yet? I mean, was there more to it? Let's see. Which one is that, Josh? So, uh, 
uh, how can we maximize our pension for retirement? So I guess if you want to work past the age of 70 and, and it doesn't happen right away, it's 70 and a half and then it's very gradual. So maybe if you wanted to work to 72 or 75, otherwise maximizing your pension, I did the math. And if I start my pension at age 62 and take it for 30 years, um, I'm going to get $50,000, $54,000 more than if I started at age 76 and, and take it until I'm 90. So I'm going to get more over time if I start it younger, but I'm going to get more on a mo monthly basis if I start it, you know, and let the actual later and let the actuarial increase kick in. So I guess it's your call um, as far as what you want to do. If you're healthy enough to work that long, go for it. And um, if you want to start earlier, go for it. Again, it's not apples and oranges. Where, where can I look to see my vested amount of money? You, you can find that, uh, I, I'm assuming uh, from that question that you're talking about your LAA pension. And so your LA pension vesting amount is going to be listed on your uh, Fidelity website, uh, netbenefits.com slash AA, and click on the flight attendant pension, and it will show you what your projection, and that projection includes all of your vested. vested. If you're just like you've got, you know, eight, 10 years, uh, and you're talking about your 401k vesting, uh, you can look at, again, the netbenefits.com slash AA, click on the 401k, and it will show you um, what your total balance is now. So if you're less than two years, I think you have to call and ask. And it breaks it up for 401k. It'll say this is like, it'll say that's the best of an hour. Yeah. Okay. I haven't looked that up. In that. No. Um, maybe I should. Yeah, I don't see how to so. <laughs> okay, um, moving on. Will long-term care insurance be available to enroll in this year during annual enrollment or through APFA supplement yeah. options? Um, AA no longer offers long-term care insurance, so they offered it once upon a time in the early 2000s, I think. And if you took it then, they offered it, you know, for a period of time. And if you didn't take it during that period of time, um, they quit offering it because the company MetLife that uh, administers the long-term care policy quit selling those policies. So they're honoring the policies that people have, but they're no longer selling that product. And APFA has tried looking into some options for long-term care, but we haven't really found any good options. I think for a while there was a life insurance that had a long-term care rider. Um, but that I don't think is an option with the person that's uh, providing the union benefits at the moment. There are products out in the marketplace, other life insurance, like the whole life as a long-term care rider. And there are still a few companies that are actually selling long-term care. So that's something that you'd probably have to talk to some sort of an insurance professional and see what's out there. And if you were lucky enough to get one of those long-term care policies back in the day, make sure you take your premiums, pay those premiums because if you're, you're lucky to have it. So. You take Social Security at 62 and still work without getting penalized if you put 30500 into your 401k. I would love that plan, but <laughs> no, when they talk about what's the income, they talk about your gross, not your net. Um, and so that 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 amount that you're putting into your 401k is not excluded from that maximum. That's a super clever idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> I, wish, I wish that would work. We have a guest right outside the window. <laughs> it's a goose. A goose. Another goose. Canadian goose. Uh -huh. What's that all about? <laughs> okay. I know you can make 22000 without being penalized. The question is, can I put anything over that in pre-tax 401k? Does Social Security look at gross or net earnings? So, Same answer, gross. Got it. Unfortunately, that would be a brilliant idea if you could do it. Uh, Brent says, thanks so much to everyone. Thank you, Brent, for being on. <laughs> 
it looks like we have a That's few other questions, to, right? Internal transfer. Once probation is over, will I receive vacation based on the years of the company or starting mm -hmm. over based on time as a flight attendant? Years of the company. And you can see that in your, I believe it's the HI8, the list, your company seniority, your classification your seniority, your, what are the other two? Occupational seniority. Occupational seniority. And uh, for vacation, it's always based on that company seniority. So if you've got 10 years as a as a gate agent, that all comes over with you. And that's in DEX, the HIA. Yeah. yeah. But then your, yeah. your bidding seniority for vacation will be yeah. your flight attendants. Uh, correct. Vacational seniority. Yeah. 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 And you have to say with your bidding. Um, but you'll get the base day, amount of days based on. Days. Yeah. yeah. But. So Which ones you can hold are based on your yeah. flight attendants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not lucky, the 20 days are all going to be April 20, uh, yeah. 10 yes. to the 30. <laughs> yes. yeah. All right. I inherited funds in a trust, FBO myself, which requires a separate tax return every year, uh, 1041, on its own EIN. Is it advisable or even possible to dissolve the trust and put these funds into a personal account? The trust being dissolvable depends entirely on the terms of the trust. Does it say it's an irrevocable trust? Probably not going to be able to uh, re dissolve it. If it's a revocable trust, um, it depends on who the trustee is at that point and whether or not they have the authority. Uh, it's going to depend on state law. Just not enough information to answer that question. They should probably talk to the attorney that put the trust together. Yeah, or get your own attorney. Or get your yeah. own attorney. <laughs> And our last question, barring any late, late minute submissions, I've heard from several people that I didn't sign up for Medicare at 65. I could be hit with a penalty. I'm now almost 67, but didn't sign up for Medicare since I had company medical and didn't know I had to. Please advise the correct response. Thank you for coming to the source. <laughs> yes, um, this is a question we get a lot in our regular retirement seminars. So if you're 67 and you're still working and you still have company insurance, you are fine. You're not going to be penalized. You just have to get one extra piece of paper filled out when you finally retire. And it's called the CMSL 564. It's a Medicare form, also known as the Employment Verification Form. And you get that form, you can email me and I'll send it to you. You can, well, not until you're ready to retire though. Um, you can download it from the Social Security website or Medicare.gov um, and you fax it into the company to the Benefits Service Center. They'll fill it out and then they mail it back to you. So it's a little bit of a lengthy process. And then when you're ready to retire and start Medicare, um, this form shows the Social Security Administration that you've had what's called creditable coverage through your company and therefore you're not subject to any late enrollment penalties. So the answer is you haven't hurt yourself by waiting as long as you're still on the company insurance. And the best time to do that form because Medicare does a 60 day look back to make sure you've had coverage in the last 60 days before you start Medicare. So. 60 days before you retire and go on Medicare is the best time to send that form into the company. Okay. Okay, I had a couple of questions about financial planners, you know, because we're not financial planners. And if you're a new hire, you know, doesn't that cost money to have a financial planner? Do you have uh, some, I heard the uh, credit union might offer free financial planning. Do you know anything about that, Patrick? They do. Financial planners are working, so they need to be paid. And uh, if you just go down to you know your local bank and, and get a financial planner, they're going to get paid a commission on what they sell you. Now, if you've only got a couple of grand in your savings accounts, the commission is going to be very small and they're probably not going to give you much time or attention. Or you can get a financial planner where you pay a flat rate. The, you're going to pay them, say, $300 and they're going to put together a plan for you. And I kind of like that because they know how much they're going to get paid regardless of which products they put me in. And so that takes away the, the temptation to put me into a product that pays them a higher commission. So I like flat rate planning. The uh, credit union also has financial planners and they're paid a salary by the credit union. So they don't get a commission and therefore uh, they uh, 
don't have that same advantage of not being compelled to put you into a high commission product. However, if you're a member of the credit union and it costs you five bucks to become a member, they'll do that planning for free. So um, that that's a, a good advantage, a good thing we have from being members of the credit union. Now, I've heard about a lot of people getting ready to retire, getting those sort of financial plans. Would it make sense for a new hire that's trying to figure out how to save money to buy a house or a car or have kids or something to go talk about a financial plan at that stage when they haven't even really started? Yes. And and the thing is, um, what we're what we're looking for is we're trying to figure out how do I get from where I am today to this goal? And frequently we talk about retirement as the goal. It's not the only goal we have in life. Um, although you would never tell from our department. Weddings, <laughs> weddings, houses, 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 kids, yeah, kids college, they, that face going back to school, the, yes. yeah, the teeth, yeah. So all of these goals we have, <laughs> and it's it's <laughs> helpful to have someone who has knowledge and experience on planning to help you, either to help you set up a plan or to review the one you've put up. Because I know you're a brilliant financial person. But it's always good to have a second set of eyes on these. And those are true for all of the goals we have, the financial goals we have in life. Great. Um, since we have no further questions and we've reached the end of our presentation, I'm um, just going to ask you guys if there's any parting words of wisdom or any uh, last minute, you know, tips or anything that you'd like to share with the uh, attendees? What I would say is you may think it's too early to start planning for long term. Yeah. You're wrong. The earlier you start, the easier it is. And, you know, we used that that allegory earlier about, you know, taking care of your body. We all know that it's easier to get in shape at 22 than it is at 62. Um, that, that's just intuitive. The same is true financially. The earlier you start, the easier it is. You know, I would say that we can't um, lose ourselves in the process. I think you have to do what's best for you when it comes to savings. Um, you know, if, if you have, if you want to go on a trip, and you can't save that month and you want to take the trip and my my advice would be go on the trip um live live continue to live your life um, maintain your responsibilities but i think that uh, a big point of doing something like this is to make sure that you you know the future will be here before you know it and so starting small doing little increases but still trying to maintain um a sense of fun life experiences yeah. And not completely shutting anything out to only focus on what's happening in the future because you don't want to forget to live for today. Mm -hmm. That's that's so important, that balance, right? You know, balancing planning for the future, but also enjoying life today and finding that balance. And most people, well, many people become flight attendants because they want to enjoy life. They want to travel, they want to see different places and have different experiences. And fortunately, there's a lot of things you can do that aren't that expensive in those places you know there are a lot of things you can do that are really expensive so you kind of have to balance it out you know maybe go to the fancy restaurant in paris you know once every couple of months and not every layover, not every layover yeah. yes. I, mean, I mean i'm sure maybe you've had these experiences but i'll be with friends of mine i'll be like yeah i, I went to you know i went to rio for the weekend or for one night to go see christ the neighbor like oh my god you flew all that way just for one night and it's like well yeah but that that, that non-rev uh, fee i think was maybe i think 50 bucks 40 bucks, 40 yeah, bucks yeah. for a business class seat round trip to go and then one night in a hotel that i used points for yeah <laughs> and so it's like yeah exactly. there's there's a a great experience there we have the flight benefit that you know, takes away uh, yeah. um, a lot of the expense. So well, I think I'm amazed they got a business class seat. So. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're in back and my Richard companion was stuck in the back, which I was like, uh, well, I think it's also really thinking about too, like what are your priorities, right? What's really important to you and allocating expenses towards that. And for me in my own life, I think about like money that I've spent in my past on things that really didn't matter and I'll never get that money back. And instead, 
you know, in my life now, I focus that money towards what's really important in my life, like traveling and doing things with family and stuff. And then, you know, for going to, I used to get Starbucks coffee every morning, you know, now I just make coffee yeah. at home and just trying to figure out, you know, yeah. where that balance lies. Yeah. And, and in my, my experiences are, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a spouse and I don't have kids. And so I don't have those, those I, I have a, yeah. you know, two fish and some struggling plants. That I'm trying to <laughs> But that I have to They're worry. getting more and more demanding all the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, and so like my my um, my experience and my view is very singular um, in, in only having to worry about myself. So when you start adding other people there, I definitely think that your um, your the priorities change. Priorities change and those expectations change because um, which I think is even more important when it comes to the um, the protections because you know. I might be able to go, you know, sleep on a friend's couch if, you know, I'll, I'll, everything falls apart and I don't have any money. But, you know, if you have people that depend on you and that income, it makes things a lot more difficult. And another takeaway and the biggest one for me is that there's no one size fits all. You know, you've got to start saving, but do it the way that works best for you, you yeah. know. So that's, you know, I talk to people all the time that are talking about the 401k that, oh, my God, all the, you know, options are so up and down and it freaks me out. And they want to put everything in the credit union fund because it's safe. And I'm like, that credit union fund or that they take it out and put it in something yeah. else, you know, when it's on and down, you know. So there's different things, you know, you need to know how risk averse you are, but whatever you Figure out what works for you and do it, but yeah. do something. That's the there's, important thing. There's so many products out there too. And what works for you yes. may not be the best plan for somebody else, you know, but there's not like a one size fits all. Well, and that's, that's really good. Like starting small is really important too. If you don't have anything, don't start. I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing a thousand dollars or, you know, half of your paycheck a month. You know, you can find a way to start small as well because it starts to snowball. When I started, my investment journey i started doing like 50 dollars a month yep. and then it's kind of grown from there obviously so that's that's really good advice too he did one I mean, and, I, and, I, and I, I will say if there's one one thing in this presentation that i think we might all agree on that you must do is put money into the uh 401k that the company matches yeah. yeah. yes. that's, that's least that's free money yes um and you know it's two and a half percent now uh, if you're following negotiations that number um, is set to increase once we do get a, a contract. Um, and match that. Where match match and, and and match that. Yeah. Match that. I don't uh, remember if we talked about it either. Um, I had to step out for a second, but with the 401k, you can also do the annual increase mm -hmm. where it automatically yeah. increases. We did talk about yeah, that. and that's a really good way whenever you get your pay raise. Um, you don't really fill it, right? Because it comes out of that. Yes, yeah. and in our our incredibly variable paychecks, you'll never notice that it went up. Yeah, um, we did have two questions pop in. All right. Um, one more question. I opted for Edelman to manage my 401k pluses and minuses of my choice. Edelman Financial Engine. They're, I mean, they're very well qualified, and they really, really, because they're associated with Fidelity, they really understand our investment options, and they're really able to give you good advice. Uh, it is not free, and so and it's not a hundred dollars a year like some of the the newsletters, and they do the clicking for you. So if you're on one of the, say one of the newsletters, the newsletter says, "Hey, move money out of the large cap index fund and move it into the small cap index fund." You have to go do that. With you, if you go with Edelman, they do that movement for you. So I mean, it's pretty much uh, you know, set and forget. Yeah, and. The, the thing is, because it's easier, it costs more. And it's just a question of whether or not you want to try and save that extra bit by doing it yourself uh, or have them do it for you. And it, that's just a personal preference. On the Medicare subject at 65, does AA require Medicare to be the primary insurer? Must we sign up if we keep company insurance? No and no. <laughs> no and no, yes. <laughs> yeah. And and actually, and we don't talk about it a lot, but sometimes signing up for Medicare at Part A at 65 could hurt you. Remember we talked about that HSA account where you can use that as, a, as an alternate investment account? If you have the core plan 
and you know if you have a core plan, you don't just accidentally stumble into that, and you have an HSA account, they block you from making any contributions at age 65 if you sign up for Medicare Part A. I don't understand why. It makes no sense to me, but it's IRS, so yeah. So if you sign up for Part A, most of us, it's not an issue. For some of us, it could hurt you. Um, so yeah, don't do it. Don't just you don't have to, don't bother. And some people do stumble into the core plan because that's the default plan for new okay. hires. So sometimes yeah, people go, oh my goodness, I didn't make a choice. And during the first benefits enrollment period they hit, they're going, I'm switching plan. Yes. Some people are fine with it because they're young and healthy and it still covers all their preventive stuff and their premiums are lower. So. Yeah, I always think about, you know, Medicare 65, but we have, we have some older new hires, so yeah, they could have stumbled into that. Um, I was thinking of my takeaway from presentation. So mine is regarding the power of budgeting and tracking your expenses. And there's, like they talked about, there's different products out there. Um, I personally use YNAB, you need a budget, um, but there's Mint and there's other ones that people use as well, and they all have, you know, different capabilities. But I know for me, you know, I've been using, I've been budgeting for about 10 years now. And early on, um, I was really struggling, like making ends meet, um, paying bills and everything. And when I started tracking my expenses, I really started to realize where some of my expenses needed to be just kind of shifted over. And that would kind of tied in with reprioritizing where I was spending my money. So um, definitely like the power of budgeting and tracking your expenses. If you're not doing that, um, this could be a good time for you to start doing that. You'll be surprised where some of the money's going. You know, we've all heard the phrase, knowledge is power. And knowing where your money's going is really powerful. Yes, it is. And it's just not in our human nature to know how much we're spending if we don't write it down and track it. Yeah. Um, I, I assume there's some geniuses out there that can do that. I, I can't do it. I don't know very many people can do it. The apps make it so much. The apps easier. make it so much easier. I had, I had a uh, a flight attendant call me a couple of months ago because she heard our first one and she started tracking it. She said, "I found out I'm spending two hundred and twenty two dollars a month on subscriptions. That's crazy." Yes. <laughs> I mean, they come out at different parts of the month, and unless you're looking yeah, at it as a whole, no. The streaming subscription week by week, yes. they're just coming out. And you don't oh, it's free trial. I'll sign up. The, yeah. free, the free trials make yes, it free. Yes. Six months later. Ah. <laughs> I'm sure I'll remember to cancel that. <laughs> yeah, I never. Uh, oh. So this is a little hack that um, we do is if we get like a free trial and it's like 30 days or 20 days or whatever it is, we're like, okay, we're watching this show. Let's, you know, let's do let's the free trial. The show. We will at that moment we do the free trial. We'll put on our calendar app the day before a reminder, a, a reminder to cancel it. Yeah, 29 days out. Yes, because there have been times when we forgot to cancel it and there's another $20, you know, that we could have, you know, spent elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so your reserves months, too. get all the free trials and bench things. <laughs> <Yeah, yes. laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so one more and then we've got to end it. Does my ex get my pension if I remain single? This may be may have been covered. If I marry again ever and then divorce again, does the last person get my pension or the first? Have been single now for 10 plus years. That's a great question. And the answer is it depends on what your divorce decree says. So in the first divorce, not the one you're planning for your second one, in the first divorce, uh, the 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 property settlement said, you know, you get the car, I get the house, you get the dog, I get the cat. And one of the things that was divided up was your pension. Or and, not. Or not, <laughs> yeah. And it may have been that you got to keep 100% of your pension. If for some reason the settlement, your spouse got a part of your pension, the way that is told to American to take this part of the pension and give it to the, the stupid ex is through a document called a quadro. Qualified Domestic Relation Order. And if that was done, the quadro was filled out and given to American, that's a painful exercise and you probably would have remembered that. Uh, most likely, and, and you will, and you probably paid for it because they're, they're expensive because it's hard to do. Um, so if your spouse got part of your pension, it would be, it, you would remember or look in the documents for a quadro. 
And that's why they ask for your divorce paperwork when you put in for your pension. So if you're planning on putting in for your pension, you need to dredge up all those divorce papers that you yeah. stuck in a file cabinet somewhere, hopefully. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to request them from the county where you were divorced. Good. All right. Well, we've reached the end of time. Any Anything else? I think we're good. good. Yeah. All right. Well, we're joining. Thanks Thank you again joining. for joining us today. We will send out a hotline with a link to this video. It'll also be uploaded to the retirement page on the website. Um, we will probably have one of these in another six months. And until then, we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.